More showers moving into Metro Detroit and temperatures drop as we head into the weekend. A fire traps a 13 year old boy inside a burning home. How he was able to escape with his family watching in terror and out of control. A man killed when his car catches fire after slamming into an Oakland County daycare. Coco. We all know texting and driving is a big problem, but now new legislation aims to address more than just texting on the road. We'll tell you how it could impact your drive. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Thanks for being with us, everybody, for the News at 4. I'm Kimberly Gill. We begin with a house fire on Detroit's west side that caused a teenager to jump from the second floor of a home to escape the flames. That fire broke out early this morning on West Euclid with five people inside, including a five-day-old infant. Everyone was able to get out except that 13-year-old boy who was trapped on the second floor. Everyone outside eventually convinced him to jump. Jumped over the fence on the side to the left right there. I've seen him sitting in the windows. And I just told him to jump. They was hollering for him to jump. I told him to go ahead and jump, man. And he was just standing on the window. He was like, I can't jump. I can't jump. Me and another neighbor was like, we got you. And we caught him. He jumped. He busted the window with his hand. And I mean, he landed on some glass and everything. But overall, I think it's going to be okay. The teenager and two others were taken to the hospital to be treated for smoke inhalation. All three are expected to be okay. Fire investigators say that fire likely started in the kitchen. It's not believed to be suspicious. In Waterford Township, a 36 year old man is killed in a fiery crash after his car slams into a daycare. It happened early this morning at the Leapin Lizards Daycare at Clintonville and Walton. The car first hit a pole and two trees before crashing into the building. The man was found dead inside the burning car when crews got there. No one was inside the daycare at the time of the crash, but one of the rooms suffered heavy damage. The driver's name has not yet been released. The Department of Health and Human Services has confirmed two children here in Michigan have died from the flu. One of the children was from northern Michigan. The second deadly case was a child in western Michigan. The department says the flu season has been moderate in our state so far, but warns that the flu virus continues to circulate. It's still recommended everyone six months of age and older get a vaccine. Homeowners in Allen Park are dealing with some serious flooding. Take a look here. This is what it looked like this morning in the area near Larm and Keppen. Homeowners tell us that this is a known floodplain area and that flooded streets and flooded basements have been a regular problem in the community for years now. In some places, it's so bad cars and buses can't get through, which meant some kids couldn't get to school today. All right, time now for a first look at the forecast and for more wet weather as we head into the weekend here. Kimberly, that's exactly right. More of that pesky rain. Fortunately, it is lighter and more scattered than yesterday, especially last night when we had some of those thunderstorms roll through also. Still have some light rain here in the city. You see to our north along the I-69 corridor, same sort of story from Port Huron into portions of Oakland County. You see that here around Waterford, scattered light rain as we speak. And it's lowering visibility too. Visibility well less than a couple of miles in many spots. But look to our west. Cloudy skies out toward western Michigan, but we're even seeing some peaks of sunshine in parts of northern Wisconsin. So drier weather is on the way, but we have to be more patient and it's chilly out there. Temperatures in the upper 30s and low 40s. Raindrops on the windshield here. Same thing on your car. 43 right now and visibility only three miles. We'll talk more about that drier weather for our weekend coming up. Hey, Andrew, today in Washington, the Senate Intelligence Committee turned down the request for immunity made by former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Devin Skillian has been following this story from us for us from the newsroom. And Devin, did the committee give a reason for rejecting that request? Well, Ken, the top Democrat on the committee says it's uh, really just simply too early to consider an immunity deal for Michael Flynn. Of course, Flynn is offering to testify before congressional investigators if he gets immunity from prosecution. The retired general was forced to resign as National security advisor less than a month into the Trump presidency after admitting he misled Vice President Mike Pence about the nature of his contacts with a Russian ambassador. He's known though to be at least one of four other former Trump associates the committee would like to hear from. The fact that Flynn may be willing to testify uh, a big development in this investigation to alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. 
The Flynn immunity ask and now denial only darkens the cloud that is hanging over this White House when it comes to Russia. And if Russia were the only problem this White House was facing, we'd say this is a White House in crisis. But now you have a White House with an agenda derailed, a party that's at each other's throats, combined with distrust and a credibility problem because of Russia. And you have a White House and a presidency that's on the brink. Uh, today, President Trump, though, had no comment when asked about Flynn. Now, this morning, though, he did tweet that Flynn should ask for immunity to protect himself from what the president is calling a witch hunt. We'll have more about the Russian hacking investigation coming up on Local 4 News at 5 and then coming up on NBC Nightly News with Lester tonight here at 630. Kim, back to you. Yep, okay. Devin, we'll see you again at 5 o'clock. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, first at 4, we are on top of stories making headlines around the world. We begin in Georgia where a bridge collapses after a massive fire erupts on a major freeway in the Atlanta area. That fire broke out during rush hour Thursday on I-85. The fire started underneath a bridge. Fortunately, when it collapsed, it had already been evacuated and nobody was hurt. But crews now have to remove and rebuild 700 feet of that bridge. Repairs are expected to take at least several months. The cause of that fire remains under investigation. Making headlines overseas, Defense Secretary James Mattis sent a strong message to North Korea today during his visit to London. Right now it appears to be going in a very, uh, a very reckless manner uh, in what its conduct is portraying for the future, and that's got to be stopped. In a joint briefing, Mattis expressed worry about North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile programs. He raised the North Korea issue in response to a reporter's question about Iran, saying North Korea is a more urgent problem. He didn't reveal how President Trump plans to deal with the reclusive nation moving forward. Here at home, Hillary Clinton criticized President Trump's budget cuts during a speech at Georgetown University. The former presidential nominee called the administration's proposed cuts to international health a blow to women and children and a grave mistake for our country. Clinton also slammed proposed cuts to international programs. The president revealed his budget earlier this month that includes big cuts to several federal agencies while increasing defense spending by $54 billion. In Washington state, a Cirque du Soleil performer recovering after falling during a performance. According to witnesses, the woman was taking part in a swing to swing act and was flying from one swing to the other when she fell and landed on her back. The show stopped immediately and the woman was taken off the stage. Cirque du Soleil officials say the performer is fully conscious and stable and was not taken to the hospital. A new plan to crack down on distracted driving in Michigan was revealed this afternoon. Our Coco McAvoy has details about the proposed bill and how it differs from the current texting ban. Coco? The current ban only covers texting and driving, but what if you're looking through your email or on social media? Well, now advocates hope all of that will end with new legislation that will prevent you from using your phone or any portable device on the road. It's human error is the cause of the majority of the crashes. The new House bill covers more than just texting. It bans portable devices altogether, things like laptops, electronic games, or a GPS. What we ended up doing here is not nearly as comprehensive or I would even say controversial as what we did in Troy. We're focusing very much on modernizing the language uh, of, of personal handheld devices. Chief Eric Hawkins from the Southfield Police Department says the ban the way it is now in Michigan is simply not enforceable. My officers are exposed to this daily and they consistently express their frustration to me about how difficult it is for them to address this issue. Jim and Diane Freibler lost their son Jacob at only 17 years old when he was texting and driving. I was texting a friend and his girlfriend's mom at the time and you know I'm not feeling well and that's the last message that is on here from him. The Freiblers have kept the phone he used that night as a sad reminder of what happened. It sucks. I don't like going to work because I was at work when it happened. I got pulled up by the sheriff. It just sucks. I mean, he wasn't there for his brother's wedding or either. <laughs> this is only the beginning of the process to get this new legislation on the books, but officials say they're optimistic. And so it's been referred to the House Committee on Transportation, and uh, we, uh, we are expecting and hoping to get a, a hearing at some point in the near future, and then uh, it's kind of off to the races. 
and they hope this is a start to ending distracted driving altogether on Michigan roads. Coco McAvoy, Local 4. Coco and uh, the bill calls for violators to get a civil infraction starting with a $250 fine for the first violation. Still ahead, first at four, the saltiest foods reveal the top five meals with the most salt that Americans are eating probably every day. A university cheerleading team faces explosive allegations. Here what caused the program to be shut down. But first, is there mold hiding inside your child's toys? How you can check and whether you need to be concerned. We'll be right back. From risk coming up all new on local four news at five and six. Pockets of the flu are popping up and some other bad viruses too. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. I'll show you where flu is still hitting hard and the other illnesses you'll want to watch out for. OK, Doc, in good health, is there mold lurking inside your child's toys? Whether it's a well-worn teething ring or a favorite rubber ducky, doctors say it's important to check, but not necessarily a big deal. Where there's moisture, there's always a possibility for mold, but not all mold poses a health hazard, especially in small amounts. In general, these types of mold are not concerning for a healthy child. A normal immune system is going to fight off this mold just fine. And trace levels of mold are all around our environment. It just doesn't come from toys like these. Dr. Kimberly Giuliano of Cleveland Clinic Children's Hospital says there is more cause for concern when it comes to children with weakened immune systems, children undergoing chemotherapy, taking certain medications, or who have received an organ transplant are at a higher risk for infection. Infections, so their parents need to be more vigilant. For everyone else, dry out any toys that get wet and look for teethers and bath toys that are sealed, not squirters that allow water inside. And regular cleaning can also help. It's best to wipe these toys just with warm soapy water or a little bit of bleach and avoid the area around that hole where the moisture could potentially get in and grow some mold. If the toy smells bad or you can see mold forming inside of it, definitely throw it out. Well, Dr. Giuliano says if a teether or bath toy has been in storage or is a couple of years old, it's safer to replace it instead of passing it down to younger siblings. All right, let's uh, check in with Andrew for a look at the full forecast. It just seems like that faucet just keeps running and running, keeps raining and raining. And, you know, even the little nuisance rain, yeah. just kind of, it just gets on your nerves. You can't figure <laughs> out the windshield wipers. Should you put them on slow? Slow is too slow. Fast is too fast. Well, it now just... we know one thing on your pet peeve list. We, <laughs> got, we got that. And I'm here to bring you some good news. This weekend, we've got some drier weather. That means some brighter weather, too, especially as we get into Sunday. Good. Out there for now, though, we're still dealing with these wet conditions that are out there. Uh, a little wet, not a lot wet, but when you accumulate all this rain that we've seen over the past 24 hours, it actually does turn to a lot, doesn't it? Over an inch and a half to nearly two inches in many spots. Still got some leftover sprinkles in areas of light rain from Gross Seal and just down river into the Wyandotte area and down to uh, Rockwood. Also a little bit closer to downtown Detroit in and downtown Detroit. We're seeing a few more of those raindrops. Same thing though in Lincoln Park, Ecorse, places like that. Also a wet commute this afternoon in Port Huron, out through portions of St. Clair County, stretching into Oakland. County as well. So be careful on the highways and byways out there. They are still slick because of these wet conditions. If you still come across any high standing water, I know you got to exercise that patience. It can be tough sometimes, but try to find an alternate route. Here's some of the good news. Sunnier skies in parts of the UP. Our friends and neighbors up around Mount Marquette, Escanaba, seeing some sunshine. We'll see some of that before the weekend is over with. I promise. 43 right now, though, and visibility has been reduced too in many spots because of that rain and because of the low hanging clouds and mist out there. And tonight it gets chillier, but we stay above freezing middle and upper 30s here in our metro zone. Also in our in your four zone weather south of north uh, I 94. We're looking at middle and upper 30s also down to around 35 or 36 in our west zone west of 275 and in our north zone. Don't worry, you'll be above the freezing mark. Also, no concerns about any ice over the next 24 hours middle and maybe some low 30s, but staying above freezing in St. Clair and Santa Lake County and temperature wise. We stay close to average or even above average over the next seven days. So it doesn't get too much chillier as we go into next week. In fact, it might get a little milder. But right now we're seeing some of those chilly 30s and 40s that are out there. You can take a look and see visibility is down to only a couple of miles as you get closer to Port Huron, only down to a mile in Flint. So that's something to keep in mind too. As you head out this evening, if you're leaving work, picking up, picking the kids up from school or after school activities, running those errands, you want to make sure you factor in some extra time because it's wet and it's a little tough to see.
Notice where it's sunnier. Remember Marquette, where I said it was sunnier? Makes all the difference. 45 there, that's two degrees higher than us right here in Motown. So with the sunshine over the weekend, come some higher temperatures. High pressure eventually filters in, the rain moves off to the east, so we're looking at temperatures closer to 50 degrees tomorrow afternoon, and by Sunday afternoon, we're looking at middle, maybe even upper 50s, not bad at all. So 35 degrees overnight, just take your time out there on the roads for your Friday night plans. Sunset is at 758, still getting later and later. That piece of good news too, day's still getting longer, folks. We're looking at 52 for a high tomorrow, mostly cloudy in the morning when you join me tomorrow morning on Local 4 News today. But by the afternoon and evening, when you see me again, it'll be 52 degrees by 4 p.m. Then as we get into Sunday and then into next week, Kimberly, we're looking at upper 50s to round out the weekend, but a chance of showers coming back before opening day. Baseball right around the corner next Friday. Back over to you. All right, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Ahead first at four, she's already won over the internet, but soon April, the giraffe could give birth when the zoo says the big moment could happen. And up next, a university suspends its entire cheerleading team. The disturbing allegations the team faces that caused the school to shut down the program. But first, as we go to break, here's a look at how the markets closed for the day. Having a graduate. Welcome back, everybody. Time now for a look at today's top trending stories. A university has suspended their cheerleading team indefinitely after some disturbing allegations. Coastal Carolina University in South Carolina says the suspension was for a conduct investigation. The investigation involves allegations of prostitution, buying alcohol for minors, and paying people to do their homework. It was an anonymous letter sent to the university's president that instigated the suspension and investigation. The suspension also comes after at least one member of the cheerleading team was arrested earlier this year. Authorities say she gave a gun to two people in order to hide the weapon from police. All right, Americans are eating too much salt, and a new government report reveals the top culprits. According to the report, the top five foods with too much salt include bread, pizza, sandwiches, cold cuts, and soup. All my favorite foods. Surprisingly, potato chips, another one of my favorites, pretzels, and other salty snacks were not in the top five, though they did come out at number seven. The report finds most of the salt a person consumes doesn't come from a salt shaker, but rather from packaged, processed, and restaurant foods. And uh, speaking of cold cuts and breads, today Panera Bread is starting to roll out a, a new labels for all its self-serve beverages. By April 5th, the restaurant chain will post signs listing the nutritional information of each fountain drink. That includes labeling the amount of added sugars and calories. The company says it will be the first national restaurant company to make that information available where customers can easily view it. And you might decide that you want water when you see how much sugar is like in some of those drinks that are delicious. Uh, and could it be this weekend? Today, the staff at the Animal Adventure Park in New York, uh, they say they expect April the giraffe to give birth either today or tonight. Millions of people have been waiting patiently for weeks for the big moment. The staff says they would be shocked if April gets through the weekend without giving birth. You can watch the live stream by going on clickondetroit.com or the Local 4 Facebook page to just watch April live and a lot of people have done it. In fact, when it went down, people were calling and putting on Facebook. What happened to the April cam? Because they are so intently watching it. So there you go. All right, ahead first and four. First grade teacher is paying it forward. What she surprised every student in her school with this week. We'll be right back. A high schooler who's only been boxing for three years now has a name across the country and the world. I never really thought about it until I went to a national fight and I thought, you can be the best, Alex. You can train yourself to be the best. Tonight at 11, meet Alejandro Wagner, a shy 18-year-old with a wicked left hook and gigantic dreams of Olympic glory. He plans to bring a gold medal back to Southwest Detroit. His story, tonight at 11. Take two media. All right, welcome back. And finally, first at four, a first grade teacher in South Carolina has <laughs> started a fundraising campaign last year to buy bicycles for her students. That's right, Kimberly. And hey, your home state. That's right. Her goal was to raise enough that. money to buy a bicycle for every child in her class. Well, guess what? She exceeded her goal by a whole bunch. Look at those kids. <laughs> Not only did every student at the school get a new bicycle, they also received a bike helmet and a lock. 
Wow. Oh, nice. You got some cousins in there? Uh, I don't know. There might be some relatives <laughs> of mine there. I don't know. What a wonderful event. In total, the teacher raised $80,000 and bought 650 bicycles. My friends like, oh my gosh, and like one of the little boys at the time, he's like, oh, it's the first time I got, I've gotten a bike, or I'm so uh, happy that I finally get to ride something and not just sit around and watch TV all day. That's fantastic. The first grade teacher says she plans to use the rest of the money to start a nonprofit to do similar things across the country. I mean, it's Detroit. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. All right, we'll see you for the news at five. Have a good one, everybody.